request chair of uh, today's session, Professor Satish Jain, to please come on stage. Thank you, sir. I would request Barna ji to please uh, welcome Professor Jain with a bouquet. Amiji, I request you to please uh, present book and welcome uh, Prof. Sarayar. And Barnaji, again, I would request you to also welcome, please, Prof. Ghosh, the chair, the introducer for Thank you, sir. I request uh, Prof. Jain to kindly conduct the proceedings. Thank you. Uh, in this session, uh, we are going to have the third Silver Jubilee Lecture by Professor Lakshmi Ayer. First, I would uh, request Professor Prabhat to introduce. Uh, Professor Satish Jain, Chairman of the session, and dear participants, it's indeed a pleasure for me to introduce to you all Professor Lakshmi Iyer, who is going to deliver the third Silver Jubilee Lecture shortly. Professor Iyer had started her career at the Indian Statistical Institute, Kolkata, where she had done her graduation and master's during the 90s. Later, she had done her doctoral work at MIT. I might parenthetically add that I also have done my graduation and master's at that very same place during the 60s. And I have every reason to feel proud about our excellent academic achievements. Since she had entered the field of economics via the field of statistics, one would have expected that she would be busy with those studies which are normally leveled quantitative economics. But that was not the case. Instead of running regressions or doing factor analysis, she had chosen to address some deeper question economic issues through an interdisciplinary approach involving sociology, history, and political science besides the discipline of economics. For example, in one of our recent papers, Professor Ayer analyzes the interplay of religion, political identity, and development in the context of India. It, yet, yet another paper, she studies the caste and entrepreneurship in India, an issue that is so close to the topic of caste in the economy, on which Professor Kaivan Moishi gave a lecture this morning. I am also particularly impressed by one of her studies, direct and indirect colonial rule in India, long-term consequences. I have not read the paper article, but I know for sure that colonial rule had enormous indirect consequences about which most of us are unmindful. With so much professional competence, it is not surprising that she had held important positions in several prestigious institutions, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, Harvard Business School, and Boston University Institute for Economic Development. Before I conclude, let me also mention, her, mention her some of the prestigious awards that she has earned. It started right in 1990, who, when she had stood first in the whole of India in the ISC examination. Later, she had won PC Malanavis Award for Best Student in ISI Kolkata, 1997. 
Robert M. Solo Endowment Prize in MIT 2003, and very recently Marvin Bauer Fellow at the Harvard Business School 2011-13. Friends, I could certainly add more to this introduction, but that does not seem to be necessary. Let us listen to her and be enlightened. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Prabhat Ghosh. Uh, now I would uh, request uh, Professor Lakshmi Ayer to deliver uh, this Silver Jubilee Lecture. The title of the Silver Jubilee Lecture is Consequences and Determinants of Women's Political Participation. Thank you, Professor Jain, and thank you, Professor Ghosh, for such a wonderful introduction. If I load my presentation, should I just do a slideshow? Showing over there, okay. You can do it. Yeah. What do I do? Control L. Control L. Ah, success. Okay. So I was told uh, that I should have a less boring title, so I thought made a less boring title, which is How Women Politicians Matter and Why We Don't Have Enough of Them, in sort of cons uh, consequences and determinants of women's political participation. So what is the uh, motivation for this talk? I was quite struck uh, where, when Dr. Shaipal Gupta yesterday mentioned that among the goals of ADRI was to provide research to enhance economic development and also strengthen the ideals of democracy. And this paper, talk is mostly about democracy. So what is democracy? So a very common definition of democracy is that given by Abraham Lincoln many years ago, which is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. This often raises the question is who are the people? And when it comes to women, I think this definition uh, of it, democracy has failed in India. And I'll show you some numbers just to, just to show that. So when you think about government of the people, we find that women are dramatically underrepresented in political office. The government is certainly not made up of women. So currently in the Lok Sabha in India, we have about 12% women members. If you look at uh, the last three decades and you look at numbers for the Vidhan Sabhas, it was only about 5.9% were on average were women. And this is not just an India phenomenon, this is quite a global phenomenon. So the global average of women in all national parliaments is 23%. If you look at very developed countries like the United States, the figure is 19%. Uh, if you look at uh, Britain, they do a bit better, 29% of British MPs are women. And not only is this not limited to India, this is also not limited to political office. If you look at leadership positions in a wide variety of fields, you will find that women are grossly underrepresented. So one figure which struck me a lot is that uh, last year in the Fortune 500 list of CEOs, there were, I think, uh, a grand total of 22 women. So this is, and the highest it has ever been is 24 out of 500. So this is a, quite a pervasive problem uh, if you look at, in the political setting, if you look at government by the people, so one is there are no women in the government, do women have a role to play in, in, in regulating or, or demanding accountability from government? There's some good news here. So in terms of the first basic uh, way that people can influence government is by voting in democracies. And here, after many decades, actually, the gender gap in voting has been eliminated in India. So last, in the 2014 Lok Sabha elections, women's water turnout was 66%, men's water turnout was 67%. This graph shows the same thing for Vidhan Sabha elections, and you can see there used to be uh, about a 10 percentage point gap in voter turnout of men and women. By the time you come to the most recent years, that has completely narrowed. In many cases, in many states, like in Bihar, the women's voter turnout has exceeded 
uh, that of men. So that is one bright spot. Is that enough to demand accountability from governments? I would say no, because, and women still do not participate in many other ways of ensuring accountability of government. So just to cite some figures from a survey we did in 2015 in Uttar Pradesh, and I would like to thank IGC for giving us uh, funding for this survey, which uh, has shown very interesting figures. So we find that women are much less likely to do things like attend the village Gram Sabha meetings, or write letters or petitions to government officials, or even to try to meet the village Pradhan. There's a 30 percentage point gap between men and women in just trying to meet the village Pradhan. So this is, you know, and, and this is true even in places where there is a, a woman Pradhan. There is still a big gender gap. So they do not participate in those kind of accountability uh, mechanisms very much. And if you look at government for the people, if one of the goals of government in a democracy is to, develop, is to deliver uh, enhanced economic and social development outcomes, well, India does very poorly on that when it comes to women. So if you just look at uh, the UNDP's Gender Inequality Index, India was unfortunately ranked very close to the bottom, 132 out of 146 countries. Uh, Professor Amartya Sen pointed out many decades ago the phenomenon of missing women in India, the fact that the gender ratio in the country is very adverse. There are, in the latest census, there are only 940 women per 1,000 men, which adds up to more than 100 million uh, missing women. Even when the women are alive and survive, their educational outcomes lag behind men uh, in many, uh, on a wide range of indicators. Labor force participation by women is uh, around 30% in India. It has not gone up despite all the years of liberalization and high economic growth. Crimes against women uh, are increasingly a matter of grave public concern. We, you know, every few days we hear of very unfortunate uh, events in the news. So I think in most of these indicators of democracy, the democracy is not happening for the women. So in this talk, I will ask, basically focus on two big questions. One is, does it matter? Does electing women to political office make any difference? Okay? Or, or the other way to put it is, if you have a government of the people, will it become a government for the people? Will it deliver things for those people? Now, in, in the case of women, it may or may not. So it, it was very interesting to see a, a column in the New York Times a couple of years ago expressing a lot of skepticism about this. Uh, so this is a person who looks around the world, and he, Nicholas Kristof, he says, looking at heads of government around the world, we found a zero correlation between a female head of government and efforts to get more girls in school or to improve maternal mortality. Obviously, doing just a comparison like this is uh, fraught with many issues and a lot of literature on this topic has been devoted to actually finding out or teasing out the causal effects of having just uh, a woman in office instead of a man rather than uh, there may be many other circumstances surrounding whether you have a woman head of state or not. Uh, and the second related question, I will re review some of the, my work and other people's work on the first question. I think in many cases the answer is yes, it does make a difference in a positive way. And that naturally leads to the second question of how can women's representation in political office be increased. Uh, so as I said, I'll review some of my work based on data from India on both of these questions. I will try to highlight along the way the th places where I think a lot more research is needed uh, and there are still many, many uh, questions left to be answered. So let's, on the first question, as I said, I will, uh, I think in many cases the answer is yes. Uh, so if you look at uh, other studies, so if you look the, uh, I will highlight a, a very well-known study by Esther Duflo and Raghavinda Chattopadhyay, where they look at uh, villages in West Bengal which had a woman uh, sarpanch versus a male sarpanch. And they found that the women, places where the women were, were the head of the uh, panchayat, the panchayats did a lot more spending on issues valued by women. So they were catering to the demands of, of their constituency. Uh, there are other studies by <clears throat> Sonia Balotra, Irma Klotz Figueres, etc., uh, showing that when you have more women in state level office, infant mortality rates go down, education levels go up. Interestingly, you find almost the same results in the Brolo and Troiano study, which focuses on Brazil. So it's not, so the nice part is you see similar results across different countries. 
I'm going to highlight a particular study I did a few years ago, which is uh, what is the impact of having women in politics on crimes against women? And here again, we are going to use the fact <clears throat> that India implemented the Panchayati Raj, which is gave a one-third quota for women at a wide range of levels, right? So at, at village panchayat, at the heads of village panchayats, at the, the um, intermediate panchayat, which is called different things in different states. You can block samiti, kshetra panchayat, etc. At the district, the zilla parishads and the head positions of zilla parishads, all of these were given, uh, one-third was set aside uh, for women. Uh, and what the way we are using to identify the effect of these things is uh, the fact that this was implemented at different times across different states, so we can compare each state to itself before and after uh, the implementation of Panchayati Raj. Okay? So just to uh, note uh, some interesting things about crimes against India and uh, crimes against women, one thing we have to keep in mind is that crimes against women are often subject to severe underreporting, especially in contexts like India. You can imagine that it's very hard for women victims to approach the police. There are social pressures against it. There's often a stigma of having been a victim uh, of, of various types of crime. So you have to take always official figures with some uh, grain of salt. And it was very interesting to do comparisons across countries uh, on, the, uh, on, um, on the official numbers. India looks very nice. So in India, about two rapes per 100,000 people were reported compared to 28.6 in the US. So it looks like you know India treats its women very nicely, but as I said, we have to worry about how these figures are constructed, and I'll show you some things later. Uh, if in just in case you think that India is so much peaceful, but the murder rate is not very different. So India reports three and a half murders per 100,000 people, and the US is 4.7. So it's not that India is always so very nice to everybody. Uh, the other part, I think there's also evidence, if you look at the National Family Health Survey, uh, which had a very detailed module on domestic violence, 66% of the women who experienced domestic violence did not tell anyone about it, not even family members. So, you know, far from being officially reported as a crime, they, it's very difficult for them to speak about it to anyone at all. Uh, <clears throat> and this is, of course, the Panchayati Raj, which I already mentioned. All one third of uh, councils have to be consist of that. And we are going to use the fact that different different um, states held the Panchayati Raj elections at different times. And most of this was dictated because they had a pre-existing schedule of Panchayat elections. The 1993 amendment comes, and most, most of the states wait for the next election to put in place this, this uh, reservation. So we can have some variation about when different states did that. So what do we find when we do this comparison? Uh, we find something which went completely against what we wanted to find, what we expected to find. We wanted to, our goal going into the paper was to show that, well, you elect women, you know, crimes against women go down, this is wonderful. And what we found was the exact opposite. We found that total crimes against women go up by 25%. The number of rapes goes up by 12%. The kidnapping of women and girls goes up by 13%. So at first we were quite horrified uh, by these results, we thought, what is going on? Are, you know, is, this, is the imposition of this quota causing such a huge adverse reaction? Uh, we, uh, the other competing hypothesis was, well, you're bringing in uh, one-third women at all these local governance levels. These women, for the most part, are completely inexperienced in, in political office and at any kind of administrative work. So maybe all law and order is breaking down uh, as a result of this. That part we could rule out because we looked at many other types of crimes. You looked at murders, you looked at kidnapping of men, you looked at crimes against property. All of these crime categories are actually going down after the Panchayati Raj uh, is put in place. So it's not that there is a general breakdown of law and order uh, because of uh, having relatively inexperienced uh, administrators or, or officials. So we started digging a little bit more uh, about what is happening. <clears throat> and this is where I think uh, the fact that what we are dealing with is data from the National Crime Records Bureau in India, which is basically the number of FIRs, first information reports, filed for the different crime categories. That is what the data is. And so we, went, we got some survey data from Rajasthan, which actually asked people, have you been the victim of a crime? So this is actual crime victimization data rather than what is re reported to the police. 
And in that, actually, we don't find any difference in places with and without uh, women council heads. So it's not, uh, I think it's consistent with the other evidence on other types of crime that it's not that there is a general crime wave being unleashed uh, as a result of electing women. What we do find which is also more interesting and more important for policy is that women express a greater willingness to report the crimes to the police when women political leaders are present. So this is what we found from looking at the Rajasthan survey which asked a more hypothetical question, if something happened to you, would you be willing to approach the police uh, for you know, certain, they had a list of uh, crimes, you know, if your property got stolen, if you got beaten up, etc. And the blue bars here, are, are the blue-green bars are the, are the percentage who say, yes, we will definitely go to the police in, in villages which have a man as the Pradhan. And the, other, uh, the brown bars are the uh, percentage who say, yes, we will go to the police in places where you have a woman as the Pradhan. And for women respondents in the survey, you see that it makes a big difference, the gender of the Pradhan. They are much more likely to say, yes, we will go to the police when there is a woman Pradhan in their village. For the men, there's hardly any difference. So that's the other bar to show, that the behavior of the women, the views of the women change about what they should do in case they are victims of crime. You find that in this survey which we conducted in Uttar Pradesh, you find exactly the same pattern. We asked them, have you ever tried to approach a police official? And again, in the places which had a woman, Pradhan, the women are much more likely to say, yes, we tried. And the men, there's no difference in their behavior according to the gender of the Pradhan. The second <clears throat> mechanism at work, so you know, just going to the police is not enough. The police also has to respond to you. Uh, and this, was, this is not guaranteed because many times uh, the police are reluctant to, re to record uh, FIRs, particularly for crimes against women. So, <clears throat> uh, we, but we find that after the Panchayat Raj is implemented, the behavior of the police also changes. And that I think is important. So that's why these crimes get recorded in the official data. One is the victims are more likely to come forward. And the second is you have survey data which shows that when the women who do go to the police, they're actually treated better uh, in places which have uh, women council heads. So they, in surveys, they say, oh, did you have to pay a bribe? No, we didn't have to pay a bribe. The police actually wrote down my complaint. They investigated the crime. I am satisfied with the uh, behavior of the police, they are much more likely to say these things when there is a female Pratham. And also we had much more detailed data on arrests, again from the National Crime Records Bureau, we had arrests for different types of crime. You see that there's a big increase in the arrests for crimes against women. And again, not for other crime categories. So it's not that the police become overall so much more efficient, but they do respond to the women victims. So uh, let me just summarize briefly some policy implications which I think deserve greater study in other work and other settings to see whether these things generalize. So one of the things which I do take from this study is that the political representation of disadvantaged societal groups can increase their access to the criminal justice system. Okay? So in one sense, this is, it's not the case that all of these newly elected women are just proxies for men. So in most states you go, there is this phenomenon of mukhiyapati or sarpanchpati, the idea that the woman is technically elected, but it's the man who's running everything, in which case we should see no difference in any outcome after the women are elected, but we do see that. So it's, they're not all simply proxies, which is very encouraging. Uh, the other part which is also encouraging is that it is not just for women. You see the same effect for other disadvantaged groups. So we conducted a parallel analysis for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes because the Panchayati Raj also gave these groups uh, um, reservation in the, uh, in the local, uh, local level offices. And what we find is the results are very similar. So after you have the SCST reservation, we find a big increase in the documented number of identity crimes. So these are crimes which are listed under violation of civil rights. It's a specific crime category, and it's just like crimes against women, it is something which is done to you because of your caste identity. It is defined as uh, offenses committed by higher caste people against lower caste people. And these are the crimes which are reported much more when you have uh, a scheduled caste person in, uh, in political office. So, it's, so I think that's, that kind of generalizability is useful, that these kind of Changing who is in office does affect what happens on the ground. 
The second thing which I found very interesting from this study is that the mechanisms of change may not be through the formal channels of power. It was very striking that we see this effect on crime despite the fact that the newly elected women have no official jurisdiction over the police. So law and order remains a state subject. It is not devolved as part of Panchayati Raj to the local level. So technically speaking, the Panchayat person cannot do anything to the police. They don't decide the staffing. They don't decide anything about the budgets. They, so it's not that the formal authority is there. Nevertheless, there are behavioral changes. Right? So there's a change in the behavior of other women and there is a change in the behavior of the police, so suggesting that formal channels of authority are one thing, but then informal norms are, uh, are also very important to, to find out the full effect of a given policy. Okay? The third thing which I took from this is that I think there are many open questions about, yes, we say that representation matters, who is in office does matter for outcomes, but at what level does it matter? So I'm trying to go back to the original skepticism which Nicholas Kristof expressed and said, well, if you look at women heads of state, there, there, there seems to be no difference. So we actually find a little bit of support for that. Uh, so we looked at, uh, so you know that the Panchayati Raj provides a reservation at all levels. And we had district level crime data, so we could actually look whether the head of the Zilla Parishad is a woman or not, because that happens by rotation. Uh, and so what happens in years when the head of the Zilla Parishad was a woman, do you get more uh, crimes reported? And we find that that does not have a big effect. Over and above, because all the districts have the same level of lower level reservations, right? Everywhere, one third of the villages have uh, women heads and so on. Over and above that, having an extra woman at the Zilla Parishad level does not make a big difference. Now again, the question is, it suggests that lower level representation matters more, but we do need more studies to see whether this matters. The other part, which I think is completely, we, 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 which we did not examine, it's a big open question, is does it matter at what level the representation is, what, how much representation is given? So Bihar, for instance, has taken a lead in giving 50% reservation for women in, in the Panchayati Raj. Uh, many other states are still at 33%. Other states have followed Bihar's lead of 50%. Does it make a difference when you go from 33% to 50%? I don't know. If there are studies which people point, can point me to, I'll be very happy, but I think this is worth uh, investigating. And the second is, you know, how can elected women representatives be made more effective? Is this, you know, just having them is one thing, uh, right? This is like the school enrollment thing we talked about earlier. Putting the kids into school in one is one first step is absolutely necessary, but after that, how do you make sure they learn? So again, having the women itself is a positive step as we have seen, but I'm sure many things can be done to make them more effective. And finally, I would put some caveats. There are limits to how much change we may expect to happen simply through changing who is the representative, okay? One of the disappointing parts of our study is that we actually, we found no evidence that crimes against women are going to decline. And we find very large increases, we are, we are saying it's because of reporting, but in the ideal scenario, we want these crimes to decline, the actual crimes. We don't find any evidence of actual crimes decline. So presumably this is the first step if more crimes are reported and more people are getting arrested for them at some point, uh, hopefully people will change their views that this is an acceptable thing to do and we will see that kind of behavior going away, but it's not happening yet. So that's the, the other part, as I said, you want to caveat. Other studies have uh, pointed out that not everything is wonderful simply because you have a woman, uh, Pradhan, instead of a man. There's a very nice study by Pranab Bardhan and Dilip Mukherjee in West Bengal, which shows that the targeting of BPL transfers is much worse under women Pradhans. They are not transferring the, uh, the resources to the right people. They attribute it mainly to the inexperience of the women leaders. They are, most of them are coming to office for the first time. Uh, there's another study in Andhra Pradesh which shows that in places with the woman Sarpanch there are much more complaints about Narega programs and about irregularities and not receiving the payments on time, etc. And there's a study by Esther Duflo and Petya Topoloa which uses nationwide data and they find that residents of villages headed by women are less satisfied with the public goods present in the village, including goods which are beyond the jurisdiction of the panchayat. So there seems, it also seems to generate some kind of resentment uh, among people, they somehow feel less happy uh, that you have a woman sarpanch, even though the actual quality of the public goods is not uh, different. So just again, that's I think part of the question of how can 
women leaders be made more effective. Uh, and so clearly everything is not most wonderful. Okay? So let me come to the second question, which is uh, getting women into uh, political office. Uh, mm -hmm. Given that, at least as I said, in many dimensions you do see an, a positive effect of having more women, how can you achieve this? The reform we analyzed in that paper was a quota, and that is the standard tool which most countries are using. That is pretty much the only tool I see being tried is a direct quota. We will have, you know, one third of, uh, of parliament or local council or whatever set aside for women. The question is how effective are quotas? Are they the good long run solution? I'm a bit skeptical about this. We have just been looking at data from the latest uh, panchayat elections in UP, that is 2015, which just finished. This is 20 years after UP started uh, the Panchayati Raj. So this is, I think, the fourth round of Panchayati Raj elections. And obviously, in, in the places, in the seats which are reserved for women, there are women. But if you look at the unreserved, seats, you have only 13% women candidates and 16% women winners. So 20 years is certainly not enough to bring the unreserved places anywhere close to, to equality. And these are obviously all the unreserved places were at some point reserved because there's the fourth round of reservation which is happening. So I don't know whether this will uh, just uh, having a quota, does it mean that we have to have a permanent quota? So I think all these questions are, are worth investigating. What I'll try to show you a little bit um, is some analysis I've done on potential alternatives to quotas. And there's some good news and bad news coming up. So the one thing I do want to point out is the importance of candidacy. So even in UP, as we saw, there were 13% women candidates and 16% women winners. If you look at Vudan Sabha data, you see the same thing. Over the last three decades, you have about 5.9% of the winners were women, but only 47 of the <coughs> candidates were women. So it is not the case that there are lots and lots of women candidates in all these elections and they just lose. There are no candidates. So in a sense, when you say, why are there no women in political office, you have to roll it one step back and say, why are there no women even trying to get elected? So a lot of analysis I will show you will focus on candidacy, on getting women candidates in the first place. Of course, they may expect that they will lose and therefore they don't enter. But if you want to think about how to improve things, first you have to get them to enter. So you can think about many, many reasons why this might happen. I'm going to group them into two broad categories. One is what I, I call demand side factors. So it could be that voters are, don't like to vote for women. You know, maybe that's the prevailing social attitude. Maybe they think women cannot be uh, good political leaders. And so that's why you know, women don't even enter because nobody's going to vote for them. Or it could be that parties uh, have bi are biased against women. After all, most parties in India are headed by men. So maybe they don't believe that women are good candidates. That could be. <laughs> One thing that we did try to see is whether demonstrated success by women in elections can change these factors. Okay? What do I mean by that? Uh, we tried to see whether what happens after a woman wins an election. So the idea is that with the quota system, it may be that women won't win in a reserved seat, but that win is kind of discounted while it was a reserved seat, so you know, what does it show? So we wanted to look at the effects in competitive elections. So we looked at, we analyzed data from the Vidhan Sabha elections where there are no quotas. So if a woman wins an election, she, she wins it. It's, it's not, you cannot say it's all oh, it was because of the quota or anything like that. And the thing we tried to see is, well, after a woman wins an election, are there more female candidates next time? Does it encourage more women to enter? It could be because voters now change their views and say, oh, well, you know, we elected a women, woman, it was not so terrible after all. Or parties say, hey, women can actually win. You know? So uh, when I talk to some party leaders and I ask them, what do you look for in a candidate? The one point, the one quality which all parties look for is winnability. <coughs> that's it. I said, that's it? And one of the people said, well, we are in the business of winning elections. That is the primary characteristic we want to see in a candidate is can they win? After that, we, you know, they literally did not care whether they are of the right views or even of the right party. One party was very honest. They said, we welcome people from other parties into our party, provided they, can, they show some indication that they can win. So that's one thing I was hoping that if women demonstrate winability, parties will be more willing to consider women candidates next time. 
And so we looked at these effects, uh, tried to look at the impact of this using the answer by data, what happens after a woman wins. Okay? Uh, so if people are interested in the technicalities, we used a regression discontinuity strategy, and you can look at the paper for all the uh, uh, technicalities about that. But what are the results? So if after a woman wins an election, in the next election we find that there is, of course, a significantly higher probability of having a woman candidate. Okay, you're much more likely to have a woman candidate. And the female candidate share is up. So female candidates as a share of overall candidates is goes up. But it's all attributable to the winner who gets to contest again. If you try to see whether there's entry of new women, so if you look at the new woman candidate share out of the total candidates, you actually find a small decline. <coughs> this was actually disappointing for us. So the first part is good. At least the woman who won gets to contest again, which is by no means certain in Indian politics. If you look at Vidhan Sabha elections, only about, now about one third of women who win elections don't become a candidate next time. So there, it is quite a barrier to become a candidate next time. So she does do that, but new, there's no evidence that new women are now encouraged to enter as a result of observing a woman win. The further thing which we did was, we find that these candidacy effects vary a lot across different states. And the way we cut the states was just looking at whether the societal context matters. We cut the states by how many missing women they have. Okay, this is a very crude indicator of the status of women. All right? So we looked at states where you have a very low female population share. Right? So this is uh, most, of the, most of the states in the north and the west of the country versus states which have a more uh, normal gender ratio, which is mostly states in the eastern and, and, and southern part of India. And you find that all of these decline in the share of new female candidates is coming from the states which have very low female population share. These are states where, it's, if you think of it as a marker for women's status, these are the states where the women are not cons given very high status, and that's where you see this negative response uh, to women winning an election. In the states with the more normal gender ratio, you actually find a zero effect on the entry of new female candidates. So you don't find an increase, but at least you don't find a, an actual discouragement effect. So I think in a sense this was, uh, these results were discouraging for us because it means that you cannot depend on an endogenous channel to ensure greater women's candidacy over time. So it is not the case that a few women can come in, show that it is possible to win, and that will generate more female candidacy, and so on and so on. This beautiful virtuous cycle is not there. So in one sense, that means you need some extra intervention if you want to have more women in political office. That could be through quotas, or that could be to, through other things. So one of the things we were, the other part we were considering is, oops, where did I do? What did I do? Sorry. <laughs> the other part we were considering is what I call supply side factors, okay? What is it that holds back women? Why are there no women candidates? And so we wanted to, we have, I'll show you some numbers from our UP survey, which was conducted in, at the panchayat level. And one nice thing about panchayat level in UP, at least, is that parties are not officially involved. So just because a party leader might have a uh, preference for male candidates or female candidates is not really relevant because anybody can stand up and become a candidate themselves. They don't have to go through parties to become effective candidates. Many hypotheses have been put forward. So some, if you talk to some political parties, they'll say, well, women are just not interested in politics. This I've heard many, many times. There are studies in the US which try to measure sort of political ambition, and they find that women display much less political ambition. They don't see themselves as political leaders for whatever reason. It could be that women perceive themselves as less qualified uh, for political office. So, you know. Official qualifications required for political candidates in India are quite minimal. There is no education requirement. There is no, uh, there are not very huge requirements. But they may perceive themselves as less qualified and not come forward. They may just have less knowledge about the political process. As we know in India, overall, women are much less educated than men, and so they may just not know how to, even if they want to be involved, they don't know how to go about it. They may have fewer resources to campaign with. Um, there is some experimental evidence in lab experiments that women are less likely to enter competitive environments. So the, there's a bunch of reasons you, know, you could think of. We investigated some of this in our UP survey, and we find that they are actually relevant. Women are lagging behind men on many of these supply-side factors. 
So for instance, they are much less likely to know the facts about the political process. So in our survey, we asked them, can women become panchayat members? And we asked a bunch of questions, but among these, you'll see that only 73% of women said, yes, women can become panchayat members. They did not even know the rule that you, it's, it's, it's certainly possible. They assumed it was not possible at all. The men were actually more knowledgeable. 88% of the men say, yes, of course, women can become panchayat members. We asked questions about their confidence in their leadership abilities. You know, can you lead a team? Do you know how to delegate tasks, etc.? Women systematically rated themselves lower. Uh, no, I am not confident. I don't believe I can get it done. Okay? And of course, if you think about interest, we ask questions like, have you ever heard a political speech? Have you go do discuss uh, politics with your friends, etc.? All of the measures, women are much lower uh, than men. Does this matter for actual outcomes in the political process? We find it does. So what we did was uh, we looked at many types of political participation in our survey. One was, have you ever been a candidate? Uh, do you have mem are you a member of any political party? Are you involved in campaigns? Have you gone and campaigned for someone else? Have you, uh, you know, attended some rallies? Have you organized any meetings, etc.? And then we looked at a bunch of what we call non-electoral political participation, which is something that I mentioned before. Did you ever attend the Gram Sabha meeting? Have you tried to meet the Pradhan? Have you ever um, written a letter to the government asking for your rights and so on? So of course, on all of these measures, there is a gender gap. So that's the first, um, whatever, blue-green bar shows the difference between men and women. It's sort of negative because women are much lower than men on all these measures of political participation. First interesting point, I think, is that the gender gaps were actually much larger in the non-electoral participation, which in one sense actually needs less organization and less effort, right? These are things like attending Gram Sabha and trying to talk to the Pradhan about your problems. Uh, so there actually the gender gaps were much bigger than in actual candidacy, which was surprising to me at least. I, I assumed that uh, becoming a candidate rec would require uh, much more effort. The other part, is, so the second set of bars which we are showing is the gender gap after controlling for the supply set factors I mentioned before, which is the knowledge about the political process, the interest, the uh, confidence in your leadership abilities, and so on. After you control for that, if you look at the have you ever been a candidate, there is no gender gap. Okay? So this is, so there, this, there's absolutely no gender gap after you control for these supply set factors. And in fact, in all the dimensions of political participation, these supply side factors do matter. So you can see the gender gap becomes much less. So if you look at involvement in campaigns, membership in political parties, the gender gap is reduced by more than half if you control for these supply side factors. So that, I think, means that there is room to improve the participation of women by targeting these factors. Okay? In fact, we, have, we are working with an NGO in Uttar Pradesh which is, has implemented a training program precisely to target these things to give them knowledge about the political process, to give them greater confidence that yes, women can also be involved and actually can win elections and bring about positive change and so on. So they are involved in this and hopefully in a few months we can assess the results of this. So we are planning a next survey to see whether the training program, uh, how well it worked. But I think the baseline survey indicates that there is actually pr plenty of room for this to, increase, to Im improve women's electoral political participation. It was the other part which was surprising to us that, that these factors are not as important to explain the gap in non-electoral political participation, which is much more of a day-to-day -day thing, not a once in five years phenomenon. And there, these supply side factors are, are useful to lower the gender gap, but very far from the effect they have on the uh, election-related stuff. Okay, so this is, I think, some ray of hope that there can be uh, action here. And finally, I'll, I'll show you some very preliminary evidence uh, on whether prior political experience in different roles can lead to more candidates uh, in, in Vidhan Sabha elections. So one of the reasons you could say, well, this confidence in your leadership ability, this knowledge about political processes, if you have some experience in a political role, you might be able to fill those gaps and therefore get on the stepping stone and become a candidate. So I'm going to look at uh, data on two different what I call pipeline quotas. So not direct quotas, because we don't have direct quotas at the Vidhan Sabha level, but are there quotas in other parts of the political system which might lead to greater women candidacy at that level. 
So I'm going to look at the Panchayati Raj implementation again, because obviously that created a pool of women at the local level with some political experience who could potentially become candidates later. Uh, and the second thing I want to show you is some preliminary numbers on an intra-party quota, a, a quota on party committees within the BJP. So if you look at uh, the increase, I'm looking at the Panchayat Raj implementation, what happened in states after, I'm looking, the, so the Panchayat Raj remembers district level and below reservation, I'm looking at candidates at the state level, at the Vidhan Sabha level. So does it create a pipeline for higher office? And yes, it does, which is actually again very encouraging. You see, if you look at national parties, after Panchayat Raj implementation, the share of women candidates goes up by 1.4%. 1.4% might sound small, but given that the baseline is 5.5%, this, <laughs> this is not bad at all. <laughs> so given that you're starting from a pretty low base, you find that that is a, that is a pretty big uh, increase. And it happens more for national parties and major parties, which are state level major parties, than if I include all the minor parties. The increase for minor parties is less than one percentage point. So, but it, you know, it's the national parties and the national and state level parties who do end up winning, so it's candidates from there which are more politically relevant, see after. And then I also looked at whether it leads to, leads to more new candidates. So remember that two margins by which candidacy can increase, existing women candidates might get, be given another chance by their parties, or entirely new candidates can come in who were not there in the previous elections. And you find that half, about 40% uh, of this overall increase in candidacy is due to new candidate entry. Election effects, the woman showed she can win in an election and that had absolutely no effect on new candidates. In fact, there was a decline. But having some, having ex, have some experience in the political process does lead <coughs> them up the pipeline. So again, this is, uh, I think, some rays of hope. And finally, I'll end with some, uh, with some numbers on the intra-party quota. So this is, the BJP in January 2008 amended the party constitution uh, to provide for a one-third quota for women in all party executive positions. So this is all committees at the district level up to the national executive committee were required to have one-third of women. And it's, this is an interesting quota. It's because it was voluntarily adopted by the party. They were not you know, forced by anybody. Uh, compared to other kinds of party quotas, say in Spain and France, where parties were required by the government to have 40% women among the candidates, not in their in internal party things, but among candidates. And when this was externally imposed upon the parties, there's a lot of evidence that many parties tried to avoid this. So in France, several parties paid a fine. They preferred to pay a fine rather than have women candidates. In Spain, there was no option. They had to have 40% women candidates. So they made sure to put them in seats which they were going to lose anyway. So, if, so I think the externally imposed quotas parties find ways to um, avoid uh, sort of sticking to the spirit of that. But the BJP, this was purely voluntary. Now, will this necessarily translate into more female candidates? So remember, the quota is not for candidates at all. It's for internal party uh, committees. In fact, I talked to somebody from the BJP. I said, how did you manage to change the party constitution to allow this? Because when you think about the women's reservation bill in the Lok Sabha, it has been pending for I don't know how many years, right? It was proposed many years ago to have a one-third quota in Lok Sabha and Vidhan Sabha. The bill has not passed. I said, how did you manage to do it within the party? And the answer actually was very simple. He said, well, we expanded the committees. So nobody actually lost their seat. We just created more new seats, and those had to be filled by women. But it still meant that one-third uh, you got one third women, which I thought was, you know, not a bad way to make sure something happens. Uh, but again, there's no reason it may or may not translate into greater female candidacy. Maybe these women, again, the idea is they may be only token candidates. They don't, they're not given any real responsibilities. They don't really develop any, develop themselves as candidates. And so what I do is I just examine trends in women's candidacy before and after this policy, whether the trend is different in the BJP versus other parties which don't have this policy. And again, these are quite preliminary results, but I think the results are very encouraging. If you compare the increase in the BJP share of female candidates compared to other parties, compared to other national parties, the share of candidates in the BJP rose by 2.2%. And again, 2.2% might sound small, but when the baseline is 5.5%, this is a huge increase. Okay? 
And if you, it doesn't matter whether you choose the, to compare the BJP to only national parties, national and state parties, all other parties, you still see that the BJP's share of female candidates goes up much more uh, after this intra-party quota is there. And even more encouragingly, all the increase in the female candidate share of the BJP is coming through new female candidates who were not there before. So the fact that you got some in, within party experience and exposure to political activity seems to be quite important in generating candidates. And I don't have a graph yet, but I looked at whether winability was sacrificed in some way, and there's absolutely no change in the probability of the BJP winning anything. So you, you, know, you get more women candidates without any change in the probability of winning. So it's from the party's point of view, they don't lose anything. They, they actually lose nothing by this policy. So I think that's also very encouraging going forward. So let me end now. Uh, I think, uh, just to summarize, I think having women in political office does change things in many cases for the better. And there are many open questions still left. Are there ways to make women politicians more effective? Can we achieve the same goals, that is the substantive representation of the, or the representation of women's interests in policy and, and development outcomes, even if women are not elected? You know, it doesn't have to be that women have to be elected, but can we in general ensure that? Uh, in terms of if you want to have greater political representation, the key variable to focus on is candidacy, and this seems to need some explicit intervention. This is not going to happen on its own. Even if you demonstrate that women can be successful, it doesn't happen that new candidates come in. There is some hope to think about alternatives to direct quotas in the form of developing the pipeline, which could be via quotas or via targeted training programs or other such uh, interventions. So I think in general, from the point of view of parties, it's, I think they do, have, they do um, have difficulty in finding good women candidates. I don't think they are necessarily going out to not find them, but they're clearly not finding enough of them. And so the question is, how can they find new candidates? How can a political career be made more attractive uh, to women? A lot of party leaders cite the fact that a political career is very difficult for women for various reasons. Can that be made a little uh, more attractive? So I'll leave you with these questions. I, I look forward to hearing more questions uh, from the audience. Mm. Thank you very much, Professor Ayer. Oh, oh. So, uh, questions are now invited. Yeah. Yes, please. If I've understood you correctly, um, winability reduces chances of new candidates, uh, and this is especially in the case where um, uh, the status of women are lower, um, using the proxy that you did. And political experience, however, increases the chances of new candidates. Can you, is, am I restating this correctly? And if so, can you reconcile the two? Um, the second question is that it's very clear from your, uh, uh, from your study and the others that women are not just proxy candidates when they're at the panchayat level, as you said. Um, so it's this sort of Mukhya Pati thing is not necessarily showing up in the data as much. Um, do you have any formal or informal insights into what exactly are the mechanisms through which these changes are happening? Is it the case that women actually are making all the decisions and this Mukhyapati thing is not true? Or is it the case that actually there's a facade of the Mukhyapati, but the women and her husband have some sort of intra-household bargaining that happens for some of these decisions? Or is it the case that now having a woman sarpanch means that the women in the community are able to come to her away from this Gram Sabha meeting or whatever other meetings and just sort of hold a conversation? What are these mechanisms? Are there, I don't know if you've formally looked into this or if others have. What are some insights on that? Just a couple of minor observations on your fine presentation. 
the, the first has to do with your finding that uh, uh, we, we, uh, that after the implementation of the quota, the incidence of crimes against women actually increased. And that was resolved subsequently by your noting that it was reporting which, which made the difference. An uh, analogous uh, uh, issue has to do with a finding in the 1980s, which is quite a puzzle then, about higher, a higher incidence of morbidity in the state of Kerala than elsewhere. And the reason again turned out to be the same. You know, that uh, higher levels of development were simply associated with greater reporting. The second issue, and this is completely speculative, which has to do with your finding that following on uh, an election which has been won by a woman, there are fewer <coughs> women candidates. Now, this could perhaps have something to do with the fact that if in a majority of cases when a woman has won an election, she's going to stand for re-election, then there might be a disposition among other women not to seek to split the votes by competing with, with that person and dilute the chances of her winning again. Uh, yeah. Uh, in fact, this uh, uh, thing, consequences and determinants of women, uh, women's political participation, uh, it was more focused on uh, the consequences towards a crime against women and reporting the crime. To me, this is one aspect of the political leaders, Panchayat leaders. Panchayat is supposed to do so many other things that needs to be taken into account. That's one. Second is that uh, reporting is okay. What about arrest and conviction? And what about uh, reconciliation and compromise between the victor and the assaulter? I think that also needs to be taken into account. And of course, uh, the system in which the panchayat leaders or other leaders operate is the same. <coughs> that, uh, that has also a bearing on all the consequences which you have brought. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, I really enjoyed your uh, presentation. Very educative for me. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Let me record that. If I'm not mistaken, I was trying to uh, put down uh, some things that you stated. And I thought I have written down correctly. At one point you said most parties are headed by men. I'm just quoting you. I think that is technically right. In the Indian context, uh, most of the parties are indeed headed by men. But my thought is the following. I'd like your response. <clears throat> you look at the Congress party, Sonia, uh, Mamta Didi, Trinamo, Jayalalita Tamil Nadu, <clears throat> Mayavati. Now these are formidable uh, leaderships of four major political parties. And those are the only four? This is, I'm stating, I, I picked up these, these four, and you will be 100% right. There are many other parties headed by. But these are substantial political parties today. There are political parties that, that have fallen on the wayside uh, in, in the recent past and in the slightly longer past. So, given that uh, these uh, ladies have been there for a good length of time, should there not have been some possibility towards an obvious greater representation, at least in terms of candidacy? And if not, what are the reasons for it? So let me actually, let me, can I take a few to answer the questions so far and then we can collect the new batch of questions. Okay? So just to uh, respond to the gentleman at the back, to reconcile whether you know the negative political, political effects of actually demonstrating winnability with the positive effects of experience, I don't have a full explanation yet. I have a tentative explanation, which is that if you have great political experience, a potential woman candidate has the ability or the confidence to persist 
even after receiving an initially not very great reaction from party leaders. If you think about somebody who does, has no experience and wants to become a leader and they try once and they're not uh, encouraged, I think they're much more likely to give up. While if you have people with more experience, they are much more likely to persist. This is based on some conversation I had with some women within the BJP. I said, you know, what did this quota give you? And they said, this gives us number one experience, which we can cite uh, in favor of considering us as candidates, and number two, it gives us confidence to present ourselves as potential candidates. So that's a, that's a hypothesis. Again, I, I don't have proof for something like that, but I think that's what makes a difference. Um, and the question of, you know, is, is there really no Mukhya Pati phenomenon? I would not say there is no. All I'm saying is the fact that we see differences happening means that it's not true that all the women are simply proxies. There are enough who are not simply uh, continuing the old situation that we can actually see an effect. So, of course, both. so we don't know, we can't capture exactly how many women are actually independently of, you know, handling their uh, duties. We tried to get some idea of this in our survey. So I think we found something like we asked uh, our uh, respondents, do you think your Pradhan is doing, doing their job independently? And the answer is about 50% for women. So 50% of the respondents say for a woman Pradhan, they will say, yes, I think she's doing her job independently. For men, the answer was 70%. So even the men are often perceived as not being truly independent, but acting under direction of I don't know who. But uh, definitely women are much less likely to be perceived as independent. So I think the fact that the, at least 50 percent, you can look at it as half full or half empty, literally, but at least 50 percent of women are, are perceived as being, as acting independently and doing their job on their own. So uh, that's a good way to split the difference. Uh, the, the split vote explanation which you proposed, I, we looked into it, it doesn't really hold. We looked at places where the women choose to contest again versus not, but even if the woman incumbent is not in the race, there are no new women candidates. So this, you know, you can call it a negative effect, or definitely the zero is there. There is no positive for sure, and we can argue how much of a negative there is. So it's a, still disappointing. We looked at arrests, as you pointed out, and the arrests for crimes against women also go up uh, after the Panchayati Raj. So it's not just that the FIR is being recorded, arrests are also happening. And exactly for the same crime category, is not for other crimes. It's not that the police suddenly become active in everything. Convictions are hard to look at because, you know, the Indian legal system takes uh, many years to process cases. <coughs> so you have data on convictions, but it tells you in this year there, there, there were these many convictions, but it may be for crimes committed many, many years in the past. So that was just a data issue. We couldn't really track it properly. In terms of reconciliation and so on, we have no data to even start uh, on thinking about it. It may be happening, we have no idea. Uh, and then you asked about women-headed parties. So actually, the, we did look at this, uh, because yes, you're, it's only four out of 40 or so major parties are women, but these are big parties. And they are, um, if you look at overall women candidate share, it is higher in these parties. So overall, I think compared to the parties headed by men, they have on average 5% women candidates, and the women-headed parties have 7%. So it's higher. <coughs> which is cause, which is effect, I don't know. Is it the case that these if people had lots of women candidates, that's why they were more willing to have a woman head or vice versa? What we do find is when we're looking at these uh, discouragement effect after a woman wins, uh, it happens only in male-headed parties. It does not happen in women-headed parties. So at least it's not that there, there is a big positive increase. That is not there. The positive we cannot find anywhere, but at least we don't find the negative <coughs> active discouragement. So there is some difference between parties headed by women uh, and men. Thank you all. Let us take a new batch of questions. So please start from this side. Yeah. Yes. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Professor. Mike, please. Uh, thank you. That was a very interesting presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask if, one, you were at all able to unpack this winnability. Um, 
I could be wrong about this, but from what I understand, a lot of it really is determined by whether you can finance your campaign. And if it is about money, then isn't it obvious that we don't see a lot of women seen as winnable candidates? Um, and there is a second question. Um, from what I understand, there's a rotation that happens, right? Like the reservation, each panchayat, you see a rotation. So not, uh, I mean, if a panchayat has had reserved seats in this elections, we'll perhaps not have that in the next. So are we really even, um, I mean, you speak of this route, right? That if people are getting, women are getting experience um, at the panchayat level, that this can then take them to the next. Uh, is that really going to happen? Because in a five-year term, especially if it's a first term, you won't really, I mean, your capacity building isn't really that much. Your leadership skills don't improve that much. And you have no incentive to, or you're unable to stand again in the next election. So how do you sort of, uh, I mean, what do you feel about those? And I'm sorry, but just if, it's, if there's time, um, could you also touch uh, whether you were able to socially profile who are these women who are winning? Who are these women who are um, candidates? Um, are they from a particular group, caste, um, class? Or, and what sort of political lineage? Are they you know, daughters and wives of uh, previous candidates? Thank you. Yeah, I guess uh, there is a quote also, in, uh, in democracy, we get the representatives we deserve. <laughs> Uh, you know, extending to that, just for your information's sake, the Congress party has reserved 50% of the organizational post for deprived section which includes women. So that's a couple of years back and it has amended the constitution, that is for your information. And, yeah, and, and, and another, I guess, I'm a bit confused about the data which uh, you, uh, you compared with BJP and other national parties on the idea of empowerment of women. The data you uh, selected, I guess I'm of the opinion, the Congress party is better represented in, uh, as far as the gender discrimination, has addressed the issue of gender discrimination more than any other parties. In sense of giving organizational responsibility or giving a chance to contest election. Now the third as far as your idea about you no know, quota system is, even, you know, even women's seats are being reserved in panchayat, but under the gender seats, women doesn't fare well. But that goes with the SCST quota also. The fact of the idea is, our mindset with the affirmative action is, we think it's not a minimum representation. We think that's the maximum representation. So overall idea has to change on the affirmative action. So it's, so I guess, the, and also, I guess if you could, uh, the social profiling, do you support also the women reservation bill, the, the lesser privileged women among SCST and OBC should be included on the uh, women reservation bill in parliament? Thank you. Uh, because the number of questions is quite large, so please keep all your questions very short. Uh, yeah, at the back. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, Mike is... Mike, Thank you, Professor Ayer. That was, that was a fantastic talk. I had one question. You know that simultaneous to the problem of women's representation in politics, we also have this crisis of women dropping out of the labor market. So you're seeing this, you know, there's a lot of conversation about declining female labor force participation. And I'm wondering when you look at this and when you slice the data, do you see any... I, I realize it's hard to maybe do causal attributions, but do you see, just the way you were talking about areas where there are missing women and there are fewer missing women, do you see any links between areas where you just find a higher share of women working in, say, the formal labor market, vis-a-vis -vis areas where you don't? Um, and in addition, you know, there's been a lot of conversation recently following Professor Pandey's articles in the New York Times as well about quotas, potentially, even in the labor market. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on those suggestions based on the work that you've been doing. Uh, a quick question, I just wanted to see if you did any research that would shed light on whether having a woman candidate at the village level impacts women's health issues in any way? Uh, 
anyone now uh, on this side? So we go to this side. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just speak up. So uh, my question is that uh, it's, it's one thing to have women candidates, but what about agenda setting? What about issues? Have you looked at uh, the impact that agenda setting has? Maybe in an election, the agendas are just more amenable to women, and and there are other organisations who have set it up, and that would lead the path to women candidates. In my experience in politics in five years, I've not seen that happening. I, I, I've almost seen that. That has been left to the rest of the society to figure out what the agenda is going to be. Somehow there has to be a women candidate. That's the kind of uh, mindset that I've seen more than uh, this is a women, women candidate that is required because this is the agenda of this election. Let me just answer the bunch of questions. Thank you all for very interesting comments. So let me just address the first question, which is, you know, what is winnability? What do parties value? Is it only money? So most parties will tell you that it's not only money. So money is one of the considerations. They say we want we want to know that the candidate will get, have we has the resources to do a good campaign. <coughs> but they also consider things like are you the right caste for this constituency? Are you uh, experienced? Do you have support from within the party? So will the party workers really put a lot of effort for you? Uh, because in a sense these are different trade-offs. So you, you could have candidates which who have lesser financial resources but a lot of uh, internal party support, and that can be a trade-off. So they don't, uh, they do weigh a lot of different other considerations. In terms of getting more information on how much money, nobody will talk. Nobody will talk about campaign financing at all. It's just impossible to get any information. Uh, in the question of you know, when it'll create a, uh, in terms of agenda setting, which uh, which you asked. It was actually quite astonishing to me that the agenda had played no role in candidate selection. Whichever party I talked to, they, I asked them, what do you look for in a candidate? The answer was only winnability. I was like, don't you want to look at what causes this person will support or what? That was not a consideration at all. And I said, the response was like, pehle to jitna hai na, uske baad wo sab dekhenge. So if, if the person cannot win, what is the point of considering what wonderful agenda they had? So in terms of electoral policy, I was quite, uh, surprised that that was not even you're deciding who should be the candidate is not at all a consideration and as I said party membership itself was not a consideration we welcome people from other parties <coughs> they're quite happy to say that so that is unfortunate reality as you say even you have seen the same thing but the agenda is thought about later hmm? and I think that will require a huge big change in in Indian politics for agendas to come first it has not happened so uh, in terms of uh, the uh, link with female labor force participation, we have not looked at it, but we can because we have this survey from UP where we have asked about uh, women's labor force participation, and we haven't looked at the link yet, but we, when we clean up everything, we will be able to at least look at the link. I could not say which way causality goes. In terms of quotas, you know, and whether they really create the pipeline, whether this is the only way. I was very anti-quota before. I said this is you know not the way to create a, uh, the best possible thing. This will have you know why should it be through a quota? Can't we do something else? I'm a little more on the fence now, especially after having written this paper showing that there are no zero demonstration effects. If we don't do something interventionist, it's not going to happen on its own. I still don't like quotas because I think based on prior experience in India, they have a way of becoming permanent, and that is not the correct situation. It is true, as one of you said, that the perception on the ground very much is that this is the maximum. You talk to at least the, all the women in UP, and we keep saying, purush seat koi hota nahi hai. there is no purush seat, but everybody is convinced that there is a purush seat. So we ask the question, things like, is it possible to have only women, uh, is it, what is it, is it possible to have an all-male panchayat? And I think 20 to 30 percent say yes. Which is, you know, technically it is just not possible under the rules. And remember, this has been in UP for 20 years now. But the perception is exactly this. That this is the only place where women can contest and other places are banned. So, one of the parts of the training which this NGO was imparting was to dispel this myth. And say that this is not the thing. They at least get the facts right. This is not what, so, that itself is, you are right. It, sometimes the quotas generate these other weird sort of um, effects that they are perceived as... Uh, as a ceiling, and then they have a way of becoming permanent, which is not 
So I think that in terms of labor market quotas and so on, if I could find a way to ensure that this would be temporary, I'm happy to support a temporary quota as a way to break the vicious cycle of there are not enough women, so we don't know what they will perform like, we're too, we don't want to give them a chance because who knows what they will do. I think quotas are good if they can be a way of demonstrating that it works. And then you have a quota for a little while, people's views change uh, permanently, and then you no longer need a quota. If that would be the case, I'm happy to support it. I don't know whether we can get a quota which is, uh, works exactly like that. All right, and then what other questions were there? In terms of what the profiles of these women candidates and women leaders, we are putting together the data, we'll have answers in some time. That's why I said these are still preliminary results. We don't know uh, all the things yet. Figuring out who is connected to who is actually quite a difficult uh, exercise because you have to go deep into the background of uh, each person. You just can't tell uh, by the name sometimes. It's very hard because they're, you know, as we know, you know Lalu Prasad Yadav's wife is called Rabri Devi. If you didn't know that she's his wife, you could not. So for some high profile people, you know exactly how they're connected, but to do it on a comprehensive scale with a lot of data uh, is just hard. But thank you all for excellent comments. Yeah. Encouragement for the woman candidate uh, in those parties where it is led by the woman, like say Mamtadi or Jalanta. I haven't asked about this, but this is something to look to ask more people about. Do you give special encouragement? So. I asked more general questions when I was talking to people. I said, you know, why are there so few women candidates? Because even from these parties, there are very few. It's like 7%. It's not huge. And the usual, the responses were not super helpful in the sense that they said, well, we don't have enough of a pool. Where will we get these women from? They're not interested uh, in politics. One guy even said, well, you know, no, among all my followers on Facebook, only 25% are women. So, you know, they're not very interested. So this was... I think that, so I was not very, uh, I didn't get very helpful responses from them, but I didn't ask specifically about what do you do to encourage uh, women candidates. Uh, before we close, I have a small question. Please. Mm. <laughs> uh, this, uh, the figures for rapes is a considerable difference between uh, India and the US. Mm -hmm. This is obviously for absolutely right that there is a tremendous under so you speak the mic. Sorry. Uh, there's a tremendous difference uh, between the reported uh, figure of rapes in India and the reported uh, figures of rapes in U.S. Two. Uh, yeah, just two versus, versus 30, 28. 28 or something. Huge. Like okay. yeah. Now, <clears throat> there's no doubt that there's tremendous underreported in India. That, that everyone would take. But it, is, uh, it seems to me that this tremendous under-reportage in USA as well. In the last two, three months, there have been a series of articles in New York Times basically uh, reporting surveys of very prestigious American universities in which something like between 25% to 30% uh, of uh, girls who are studying in the, in the universities have reported rapes and uh, other uh, sexual harassment. Most of them did not report. Most of them did not report because they knew that authorities would not do anything. In some cases where rapes were reported, including universities like Berkeley, in fact nothing was done. Uh, indeed, the instead of taking action against uh, boys uh, involved in these crimes, uh, indirectly there was some harassment to those who were victims. So it seems to me that there's a lot of under-reportage there. Now whether under-reportage in USA uh, is uh, less compared to India, or we really don't have any uh, uh, figures either way, as far as uh, I know. So it would be actually, uh, it's uh, difficult to say whether in fact uh, uh, mm, 
if all the report, all the rapes are reported, whether in fact uh, the rapes in India would be less or more, it's, uh, exactly. it's, 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 it's not possible to say. It's not possible to say because you're right that there's yeah. under-reporting everywhere. Everywhere, and the, it's of, uh, the proportions are massive. We are looking at one third, 20, even 25% yeah, yeah, yeah. figure is taken. Is it uh, 28 uh, rapes per million? And here we are talking of 25% girls in prestigious American Correct. universities yeah, yeah. reports. In fact, so, I think one, one woman is suing Harvard, saying because you didn't do anything uh, to help, negligence, uh, and so on. So yes, it is. That is exactly. True. So thank you very much. Very, very interesting uh, presentation, and thank you all. Now we are the